Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Garino. I'm a director of sales at Bosch, responsible for our video business. To my left, I have Jeff Drews, uh, senior sales manager at Southwest Microwave. Uh, Jeff holds a CPP and PSP. And then to his left, I have my counterpart, Anthony Crawford, who is an application design specialist at, at Bosch and also holds a CPP. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting, engaging discussion here. Uh, we only have like one or two slides, which is fantastic. So it's going to be a lot of conversation. And, and I hope that at the end, you know, definitely have questions because this is to me really a, a, a thought invoking discussion on risk assessment uh, basics and what we're calling from curb to core. So with that being said, you know, again, I, I want to kick this over to the experts and, and Jeff, I, I'll, I'll ask you to start it off. Curb to core. You know, what, what do you see the meaning of, of that as, and, and how would you explain that? Well, I, I think the easy way, and, and looking at this slide, we put this up here, um, the common thought is maybe it's your fence line or your perimeter to the inside. But um, Anthony and I both have discussed this in, in depth, and it's, it's well beyond that. Um, it, it, it depends on your individual site. There are a lot of parameters to go into where your curb site starts. Um, but it could be, it could be a, a, a road. It could be the neighborhood. It yeah. could be, it could be a CSX rail yard right beside of it. Uh, and, part, and part of that is, you know, a lot of times we when we talk about curb to core, uh, think about how the terminology is listed. You're going from the outside in, and a lot of times we stand when we start to look at our, uh, how we do our security posture, we always start on the inside. And I think a lot of times that's been a detriment because a lot of, when our bad actors, we think of threats, yeah, there's inside threats, but a lot of times it comes from the outside, whether it's storms uh, on the initial slide we had, when you start looking at a lot of man-made issues. So there really is not just from the curb or the little blue line outside your front gate that says U.S. government uh, or whatever property line you may have for whether it's a, a chemical facility or there's always a lot of other curbs to think about. And I think uh, even beyond that, I think it's changed. Um, 30 years ago, it was a physical thing. Right. Um, not my area of expertise, but we had several speakers yesterday uh, discuss the cyber side of things. Absolutely. Right? And, and those are vulnerabilities and threats, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But that's part of the whole assessment. It is. And, and a lot of times we just think about, you know, now if you, if you do a quick internet search on a threat assessment or a vulnerability analysis, you automatically, your first three or four are gonna be a cyber. And a lot of times, it's, it's really easy to go, oh, well we've gotta do all of our cyber security, but if I can actually walk up to your switch and get into a port, or I can go to a perimeter camera and tie into the network, I've already physically accessed your network. So uh, when we think about that, it is, uh, there's a lot of, because uh, if I can, you, you think about it, if you're, you're tied down, you're not able to do what you would normally do. And so that's, I think it's important to think about the, the physical asset of it, the aspect of it. No, absolutely. And you both, you know, you brought up great points there. And, and, you know, some of the information we're showing here is from industry standards, from the PSP and, and looking at risk assessments and um, talking about physical versus cyber, you know, kind of expanding on that, you know, when we talk about a risk assessment, versus a site survey, right? Because two very different things. Can you guys get into a little bit more detail in terms of you know, a risk assessment versus just a, a general site survey? Well, I, I think it, it, it's, it's where your mindset is, where, where you start at. If we look at these knowledge points up here, as Mike said, this is straight from a exam review that I had to take from, for the PSP. The same stuff is in the CPP exam. But it starts with your asset. What is your asset? Um, what are the mitigating factors to that asset? What's the criticality of it? Is it a nuclear plant and we're at risk of terrorists getting a hold of nuclear materials? Is it um, on the other end, um, not a physical thing, but your, your, your information, your trade secrets, intellectual your, your intellectual property, our, our state secrets, you know? It, it, all of those, but those are all assets. 
and assets have to be evaluated to understand what their risk for uh, what happens if they get out, what happens if they're um, accessed, what delay times, all of this comes into it. Threats, vulnerabilities, and then the impact of these threats and vulnerabilities. But I think, back to your question, Mike, the, the difference is, are you taking a holistic approach to figuring out your site security rules, your risk assessment, or are you trusting, and I'm a sales guy, so I mean, I, I say this with, with all sincerity, are you trusting your sales guy to tell you where you need a camera or where you need a, a perimeter sensor? Because that's where a site survey yep. comes in. And I, I have been, had the, either the fortunate uh, opportunity or the, uh, the horror of seeing years and years of specifications come out to be able to add to a system or to be able to build a system. And uh, I hate to say it, but you know, long after Walmart had bought up the last VHS tapes for our recorders, there was still specs that were coming out that had things that dealt with VHS tapes that dealt with, they dealt with products that were not just antiquated, but were no longer available. And so, you know, depending on whether we're looking at a site uh, or are we looking at a global stance, and for us to be able to do analysis of our data points, we have to have those, we have to have, as the, the, the initial, the, the previous board panel was sitting up here, they talked about what's the mission. And so you really have to have that, what is the end result of everything that we're trying to do? Because these are not cheap to be able to do uh, not only are you looking at maybe bringing in a third party consulting group or a person, you're actually looking at internal time, internal resources, the activities that you're doing. Are you using regulations or guidelines or specs that maybe haven't been looked at since the, the, the person that put these together 20 years ago? You know, the, the years we've been in the industry, uh, I tell everybody, and I, I age myself when I say, yeah, I started with a, a butt set and an analog multimeter. Most people look at me like I'm weird, and I go, I wasn't the butt set. It was actually what I used <laughs> to listen to the panels with. And so w we do change, and, and, and it rearranges. And so I think we really have to change the way we think about things, the way that we approach how we're doing it. Uh, had a conversation yesterday, and I said, ultimately, if you look at a video system, there's three components to a video system. You have an imager, you have a transmission line, and you have a viewing station. Everything else in between when we add the NVRs or we wanna, now we wanna have interoperability between our access control and our building automation systems. Now, now we're starting to add to and, and on top of, and that not only does it make it more complex, but now we may have to have more eyes on the ball to be able to cover that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one of the things that, that the three of us were chatting about earlier is, um, you know, from a site assessment standpoint or a site survey, uh, if the customer doesn't necessarily know what they're trying to accomplish, right? And, you know, let's, let's put cameras everywhere, right? I need coverage here. I need coverage there. But at the end of the day, what's the mission? What, what are you looking to do? Is this an application where it's just a general overview coverage camera? Um, is this a choke point where I need identification? either for a pedestrian or a vehicle. And, and you know, from Bosch's perspective, that's why our line card of cameras, we have so many, right? Because they're very application specific. And so a lot of the times on these site walks, and I'm sure most of you have experienced in the past, it, it's a lot deeper of a conversation than, yeah, we just need a camera here, right? What are we looking to accomplish with that camera? Um, so up here we have threats and, and vulnerabilities. Um, you know two different things, I guess. So do the two of you want to allude a little bit on, uh, you know, what the difference is between those? Well, at, at its core, a threat comes from the outside and a vulnerability is something, not that it's an inside threat or, but a vulnerability is something that an organization has control over to some extent. What are your weaknesses that may give more credence to these threats that may, uh, exponentially increase the the threat that's there. So, I mean, that's yeah. the that's the core difference right there. But application, it can go a long way. And you know, a lot of times when we look at threats, it kind of goes back to the the SOP that's been sitting on the desk forever. 
has the threats changed? Well, the facility that you're in or the site that you're trying to do this with, has it went from an industrial area to now a mixed use residential area? Uh, or has it actually declined and you're the only facility in the area and it's a blighted area? Do you, do you, you know, what, what threats have changed? Uh, and here again, sometimes it's nice to get outside of our fence line and, and actually see what's happening. Because when we look at threats change day to day, I mean, two weeks ago, the threats that we have now, uh, two weeks ago versus now has, has changed. Maybe the thought process of our, uh, our stance that we take have changed because now the threats that we're looking at may not be so much as a, as a physical one as it now it is an emotional movement through people. So as that changes now, uh, now your threats aren't so much as the, uh, you're in Tornado Alley, uh, as it could be the fact that now you've got people that have, uh, have changed their thoughts about maybe the way the company operates or, right. or the way the industry that they work at or they, they are working in change. No, absolutely. So um, now you've moved from your threat though, now, now that interacts and changes your vulnerabilities uh, because of the security posture that you've been taking to take care of those soft spots that may not be a soft spot anymore. Yep, no, absolutely, great points. And, and Anthony, you alluded um, to earlier about uh, you know whether you're bringing on an external consultant, uh, you know some of the costs, you know whether it's hiring a, a third-party consulting firm or you know time, effort, energy. You want to expand a little bit on the cost of a risk assessment for those those factors. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of people think about this if they've never been involved with doing a true assessment. Uh, they, they think, well, you know, they're going to come in, they'll have some clipboards, they're going to take some pictures, they'll make a few notes, and, you know, they'll, they'll hand us a 400-page document that tells us everything that we need to do to get it fixed. And that's not really, when I've been involved with anything, that's not how it works in the real world. And the other thing that we have to, to take into account is a lot of times we want to, to say we're doing due diligence when we have these given to us, but once it's written and documented that these are your weak points, uh, CPP, so when you start looking at the SAFE Act and you start looking at the fact that somebody comes in with a document and once it's documented and it's put out that, hey, here's a, here's a weak spot, here's a vulnerability that you have, and it kind of goes on the stack and nobody does it, the cost of doing that initially, whether it's $300 an hour with travel and per diem, and I mean, you know, what, whatever it is that you may look at, and 300 is probably really cheap now. Uh, but when you look at that, if you take that assessment, now you're looking at even more cost because you didn't actually act on it and there is a, an incursion or an occurrence. Somebody, you know, wrongful death suit, what's it, what's it worth for uh, your, if you're in a, you deal with data or you deal with manufacturing, what's it worth for that to be down for weeks at a time? Mm -hmm. You have to evaluate those things. And, and I think they change. There's, there's upfront costs, right? Right. And, you know, I, I have the luxury, I, I, as we talked about my title earlier, uh, I handle everything for Southwest Microwave, U.S. federal government and commercial nuclear, two very highly regulated industries, right? Right. Um, I go to a nuclear site, there's a site security plan already. Um, there has been a real risk assessment done and that is a changing thing. Um, it, it, it's a living it, document. It's a living document. Right. And not only do they have the upfront cost of having created this, but then they'll send their, they, they do their testing, they send their red teams in. They'll, they'll assess and analyze actual threats perform tests, those are all part of that risk assessment because right. things change and new vulnerabilities may be displayed. You know, you go to a more non-regulated site, um, for instance, outside of my Southwest microwave world, I was sort of involved in the infancy of um, the medical marijuana industry in Arizona. And quite frankly, the specification document that the government put out uh, would allow these facilities, grow sites and dispensaries, to put a $500 eight camera Costco DVR in. 
yeah. right? Yeah. That was within the realm of, of reality. And then at the same time, if you go to Canada, perimeter security is required, multiple yeah. layers, uh, access controls, uh, I mean the whole, the whole nine yards, right? But even in both areas, they're, they're changing. They have to be, it has to be a living document. It has yeah. to be flexible. So you say we had more security regulation for our laydown yards than we did for yeah and and, and and I, I, and I'm not disparaging that industry. I'm not the expert that says that this is what was needed or not, but also I shouldn't be right. <laughs> I, I'm I'm in there as a as a salesperson. Um, I, I had an argument one time. Somebody had a safe room in the back of a medical marijuana facility. That's where their safe was. That's where they had all their product and their cash. Right. There was not a single camera in that room, not a single sensor in that room, and it was attached to an outside wall with a piece of drywall that connected it to the outside. And the guy in me that says, it's probably appropriate you have a camera in here at least, yep. says that. But the guy who has a specification or not really a risk assessment document right. that says, I don't need that. He doesn't want to spend the money, right? And so it, it, it is such a, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to live in a, a highly regulated world where there are a lot of rules and specifications. Well, when you said, uh, coming from the, my, my history of growing up in the country, we always had a saying that if you don't expect anything, you're never disappointed. And so I think a lot of time we've set that bar so low uh, we call it a race to the bottom. You know, from the, you hear it all the time in the sales world. Oh, it's a race to the bottom. We can't compete with that. And I think a lot of it goes exactly what we're talking about here with this model, uh, or the the whole process is education. Yes, mm -hmm. is a fundamental understanding of. Uh, you know, I, I deal. I, I am fortunate that I get to deal in the government realm, or and and there are a lot of guidelines and processes and approved product lists and you know everything that we go through to, to make sure that whether it's a, a three-letter agency or somebody in uniform standing post has the adequate equipment to, to, to secure whatever facility yeah. and I think a lot of times when we look at that the they want to just meet the bare minimum Right. And so a lot of times the education of, well, and I'll, I'll use Bosch, for example. We say, well, that's, you know, there's a lot of good video cameras out there. My iPhone makes really cool videos, especially with the slow-mo. But whenever we look at what we need to do beyond that, how do we, how do we go back and, you know, when we start looking at this, part of what we have in a system now whether it's video, whether it's data from uh, fence incursions, whether it's uh, NARFAR, where we're looking at uh, uh, you know, misses or, or nuisance alarms or what have you. When we start going back through this whole process again, which should be an ongoing cycle, whenever we go back through that, we use that historical data to say, look, you know, we're really concentrating on an area that we haven't had this issue. Or, is that a different threat now? Right. You know? yeah. yeah, I know you, you mentioned earlier talking about um, an old spec, right? And I, we've all seen it, that specification that comes out and, and you look at the, the product and you say, that, that's been end of life for six years. Um, I think tying that into this is, is creating standards, right? Creating those industry standards. And it, it's as technology evolves, it, it's a constant evolving document. Um, but holding ourselves and, and everyone in this space, you know, accountable to these are the standards right. required. And yes, they will vary based on markets and, and level of regulation. But uh, piggybacking onto that, obviously, there's lots of benefits, right, to it to a risk assessment. And these two gentlemen have have hit on a lot of those points. But besides just protecting your people, your physical assets, um, I want to go into a little bit more on on. You know the insurance and the regulatory, the benefits there of, of a risk assessment for folks. Well, I, I know starting 30 years ago as a technician, uh, there was a very large chemical company that I, I was an embedded technician with, and literally every fire alarm in that plant, which was about a two and a half mile by two and a half mile plant, had to be tested. 
and this was a requirement from FM, uh, their insurance company. It was obviously it was an added expense because they brought in somebody to ring, run water and ring bells, or and it, when it came time for a discrepancy report, when I started handing in the discrepancy reports, it was a pretty good sized list. Uh, you think about pulling fire water. I know we're kind of moving, but when you start thinking about fire water coming out of the river, there's a lot of things in the river that they're not really filtering for because, well, it's going in a sprinkler system. Well, when you run your sprinkler system, where'd all the shells and the gunk and the muck out of the, out of the river go? Yeah. Straight into your sprinkler system. So as I started handing these in, all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, we haven't had these discrepancies before. Well, let me just rip that Band-Aid right off this cab. Um, and, and so that's literally what happened was all of a sudden they started seeing the truth and they, they started seeing that their vulnerability was they had not performed the tests. And it could be a fire test. It could be your, when you start looking at pen testing, whether it's cybersecurity or, or any. I'm just using one that I knew was very eye-opening because at some point the insurance company starts laying issues with them and starts holding their policy over their head and for a chemical plant that's not a good thing for somebody no. to do no. uh, so needless to say there was a, a ramp up they had to go back and change their uh, the whole process on what they were doing uh, for maintenance and so they started looking at maintenance as part of this cycle that they included in their mitigation but i think there's the, the whole cya right and especially when we get into insurance um, and the mindset today of litigate, 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 right? Um, if you have to end up in court because there was a tragedy at your facility, and whatever your asset was, munitions, uh, uh, data, uh, uh, nuclear materials, whatever, the whole gamut, right? A risk assessment should have been done to evaluate what is the risk and what is the criticality of, of, of that being released, that getting into the public. And now something happens and there's a tragedy and everybody and their mother is suing, <clears throat> somebody's gonna do an evaluation of this risk assessment right. and they're gonna find the holes. And it's not that you have to have filled every hole because some things change and some things yes. we don't know. We've talked about, you know, you could build a site to a current specification and, and things have changed over that time. But if you as an organization can't show that you are taking active approaches to make sure that these things are covered, right. um, it, as simple as, I, I, you know, it goes well beyond this stuff. I, we have a buried cable system at Southwest Microwave. It goes in the ground, works on leaky coax, RF, right? And I have a site, very high profile, and they take all of their snow in the winter, which is filled with salt and to melt the snow, and they pile it up right on the edge, on a concrete pad of an edge of a zone. Well, what happens is all that snow melts, yep. takes all that salt and that sand right into the buried cable zone. And all of a sudden, that buried cable system doesn't work very well because they changed the soil composition. And they have a hole right there. Yeah. Now, as a Southwest Microwave representative, I've informed them of that, yep. right? Whether they have taken things to address that situation, that's up to them but now something happens and there's a breach in that spot, they are wide open, right? And that, that's the kind of scenario that we're talking about right. where y y your vulnerabilities change. Your, and, and then your risk, the insurance company doesn't like to cover those things when, the, when litigation proves that you were at fault or you were negligent is the word. And that, that goes into the, we get into mitigation. You know, mitigation could be as simple as what's your maintenance plan. Yeah. Uh, you, you look at final denial barriers when we start talking about perimeter security. Um, I had the ability to, to, to go through, and, and this is a prime example. You know, if you can't plan it on the front end, you're not going to be able to maintain it and operate it on the back end. And, and we're literally just scratching the surface on this mm -hmm. whole process. Yeah. But maintenance gets into one of those where I had a call one day, and, and it was a secure facility. 
And the final denial barrier is usually that. You usually don't use it for access control. It's a final denial barrier. It keeps that car, that vehicle, motorcycle from coming through. Every time it rained, the barrier came up. I said, well, when's the last time you had maintenance on your loops? When's the last time you actually tested the loops in the ground? They said, oh, well, I don't know that they've ever tested them because they didn't have a maintenance program. They had their in-house maintenance guys that would go out and put a little grease in the bearings and you know, check and make sure the wear and tear was good. And they would cycle it a couple of times and everything was good. And so I took a bottle of water, took a knife and popped a hole in it and just sprayed, because they kept saying it's not the loops. And I sprayed water on the loops and sure enough, the barrier just came right up. And so what had happened is, it, it was literally all of this, it was the fact that they had designed an inferior loop system, they had installed inferior loop quality cable, they had not performed any maintenance on it whatsoever. And so as the pavement moved, it chafed the cables. So every time it rained, it created, it created the, the, the ability as a resistance that it was, so the barrier came up. And so it's one of those that you look at and you go, that, that definitely is a risk. I mean, that's one item, but you think about all the other things that we have in our facilities that we go through. So when we, when we talk about literally doing these assessments, um, it really is a curb to core. A lot of times you need to step out. You may not be uh, lucky enough to have 15 acres of buffer zone around your facility. Uh, I'm starting to see more and more now where they're not even having physical fences they're working on PIDs, the perimeter intrusion detection, where now we're setting up microwaves, we're setting up um, video analytics on the cameras, and we're setting up a lot of things to, to, to put in uh, IP speakers. I would have never imagined 30 years ago when I started that we would actually have a plug and play speaker in the network with the cameras, or that right. the cameras would do what they do now. So, it's, it's, so it really is one of those you know, sometimes we have to, we were talking earlier about boxes, thinking outside the box. The box that you're in right now may not be the right box anymore. You may have to go find another box. And, and you know, I think fantastic points from both of you here. And, and you know, it really comes down to standardization, best practices, right? Because each individual entity, their challenges, their needs are different, right? So if I'm talking mm -hmm. about a... Uh, Federal facility versus uh, you know some, somebody in the cannabis space versus education, right? Different challenges, different needs. Um, so, how would you recommend? I guess again, because we're we're really just scratching the surface from a high level overview. Um, if I'm an end customer and, and I'm like, this is fantastic, you know, where do I start? How do how do I start? You know, if I want to develop that in house best practice, where where do I even begin? I've, I've seen a big change with the, the private-public partnerships, uh, education. You know, I, I've noticed, especially on the government side, there I see more and more people, especially I guess you could say as there's a change in the guard, that there's more and more that are technology-driven and they realize that um, the sometimes just because grandma made it that way doesn't mean I, I can still use her cast iron skillet to do the cornbread in but I may have a different technique for the, for the actual flower. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, I think that the education, seeing what's out there, not just doing, I know when the internet first started and I would get calls from customers or I would meet them and they would go, oh, I've been on the internet and I found, and it, I almost cringed because there's a lot of things that are out there that, are, that look good, but may or may not. Ask for proof of concepts. Uh, you know, manufacturers have no problem in coming out to set up a proof of concept, especially when they know their products work, sure, more than happy to come out and do that for you. Let you test drive it. Absolutely, and, and uh, our analytics specialist, Matt C., who's gonna be presenting later today, he gives a, a great analogy. He says, you know, analytics look great on a data sheet, right? But it's different in the wild. And that's why we do proof of concepts and, and yeah. wanna physically get that equipment out in your environment because my environment versus yours may be completely different based on environmental factors, things of that nature. So, um, gentlemen, I mean, this, is, this has been fantastic. I, I appreciate the conversation. Um, as you see here, right, this is, we're, we're just scratching the surface in terms of 
general risk assessment and, and the next steps. And uh, I think doing forums like this, I know I've gotten a lot of positive feedback over the, Bosch has continued to do more and more with strategic partners and the level of education specifically to the end user, right? In this industry, the integrators play a huge role, but there are end users that are becoming more and more self-sufficient and saying, you know, we need to be educated. We need to have not only direct communication with our integrator partners, our distribution partners, but with the manufacturers. So I think, like we mentioned, this is technology moves fast. Uh, it's constantly evolving. And, and we have to continue to, as an industry, create these standards, develop these standards, and implement them um, because that, that's really the best way to move forward. Gentlemen, there are any... Uh, Anything we didn't hit? Any closing comments from either of you? Or, or should we open it up to the audience for q and A? I, I'm, I'm good for somebody else talking for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you see out in the market uh, or, or uh, some customers different levels of assessments? Uh, a lot of what you guys were concentrating on is the, se the security side of it. Um, and I know someone mentioned holistic approach. Um, is there different levels to the assessment that you see where you have to evaluate everything holistically. And what I mean by that is um, the electrical side, the HVAC side, the architectural piece of, of that. Um, I know you guys concentrate a lot on the security piece, but um, is the market pushing or have you seen anything where it says, I just want the physical security piece of it? And then what kind of risk would you see uh, doing just the physical security versus, hey, the barrier is not working, but the power is no backup. So <laughs> if the power goes out, the barrier's not going to work either way. So I think that um, I think it's, uh, and, and I would say unfortunately, but I think a lot of that is industry specific, right? The the higher value or the higher risk that your asset is, the more holistic approach the industry as a whole takes. Um, if if I go back to my nuclear. Those nuclear sites have a site security plan. They have done a risk assessment. They test that risk assessment. And they go to the, the detail of verifying that they don't have any overloads on battery backups, that their power grid is enough to handle it, that um, their HVAC systems. And then vulnerability comes in, right? You, we say outside of security, but is an HVAC system in some way, or is there an entry point? Is there, and so you have to look at that on a holistic view. If I go back to the other extreme, the uh, cannabis industry in Arizona, no, they're not doing any of that. Should they be doing some of that? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so it, it, really, it, it really ranges. But if you're doing a true, even a security risk assessment, risk analysis, you have to take a look at all of your vulnerabilities. And power grid, um, uh, you look at data storage, if my HVAC system goes out and all of a sudden my server room is, is, is overheating, that's a security risk. Right. And you have to evaluate that, that, that holistically. But unfortunately, a lot of this, unless it's a highly regulated industry, it's left up to the, the end user or the site to make those determinations. Um, and you, it's extremely hit and miss what level they go to. Well, and with our systems tied in as much as they are now, everything's, as we talk about the uh, internet of things or you know the coffee maker knowing how much creamer you've got in the fridge or what have you at home, we tend to not bring a lot of that into our workspace. We really tech up our house. We really tech up our car. We tech up you know, chargeable packs in our backpacks when we're traveling, things like that. So I, th I think it's incumbent, it goes back to education. Who are you bringing in to do consulting? Is it in-house? Are they looking at everything? It's pretty bad whenever you're putting in a, a security system or part of a security system, whether it's a, a perimeter final denial barrier or things like that, and your grounding structure is better than the utility grid's grounding structure. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that, it, it really is important. And I know we did focus on the security aspect of it, but a lot of times, Security goes so much more a, a threat could be. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a nothing but a data center, I'm pretty sure that security and vulnerability for your, you know, when you look at some of the uh, glass buildings in the area, 
they have just as much uh, capability of generating uh, electricity as as some of the other you know municipal power plants because they understand they've got to have the power they've got to have the battery backup so I, I do I think it is I mean whether it's holistic or not if I walk in somewhere and we're doing an actual site walk and they just start talking about cameras well I may see a, a microwave head hanging somewhere. I see different things going on. So when we start, I, I usually ask a lot more questions. And it, it scares me when I go on job walks and you just see people taking pictures of stuff or they're there to do an assessment and all they're doing is taking pictures, making two notes and walking away. Uh, so so if, they're, if you're not, if they're not, people don't ask questions about, well, where is this, is this tied to a generator? Is it tied to battery backup? Yeah. You know, when's the last time the batteries were cycled? I think, I think one you know, common thing is IT now, right? So IT is involved in, in all these discussions, right? Because we're talking about um, vulnerabilities and, and anything connected to the network. And so if anybody sat through uh, Dave Brent's session yesterday on cybersecurity, I mean, it, it's quite honestly, it's scary, right? It, it's the point of entry for these hackers and, and where are you vulnerable? So IT to me is kind of this central entity where is it touching their network? And I'll give you an example. Um, two or three years ago, I, I was dealing with one of my customers who's a higher ed customer and I deal predominantly with public safety. And they come to me about NDAA. And it was their IT department that was asking and, and they're, you know, they get grant money. So they went around to everyone and said, we need to make sure that your equipment is compliant. So I think, yeah, it, again, for us in, in the security space, it, it expands a lot further now because I always see IT as that kind of common where if it's touching their network, whether they physically own it or not, they see, hey, this is a potential threat, whether it's the HVAC system, whether it's the camera, um, whatever it might be. So as, as we do these assessments, yes, that all has to continue to be part of it. I think that if we bring all, uh, a lot of this back and encapsulate it, you know, we, we keep talking about education, we talk about understanding regulations, we, we talked in the, in the beginning about the difference between uh, a site walk. Um, uh, you have to have a certain level of, as, as an end user, you have to have a certain level of knowledge and understanding. You don't have to be an expert. But I am telling you, you can't trust every quote unquote expert. As Anthony said, I've been on site walks, he's been on site walks, people are just snapping pictures at a camera and then coming back with a quote and saying, you need these, right? Um, not everybody is us, and, and not to toot our own horns, but, but we look at things holistically because we've seen a lot in the industry, right? Um, I will go to a site often, and I'm, I'm there to look at perimeter security. And my first question when I go is, what is your threat definition? Right. Because your threat definition dictates to me the level of security I need to take this. And if I put that simply, if I'm at a mom and pop storage lot trying to protect from copper thieves or people breaking into a, a warehouse that, that there's nothing of real value, then I may tell you you want one microwave here. If, if I'm at a um, DOD facility, I know that the common for us is to have two microwaves stacked. Why? Because I need to be able to get a prone crawler right. sideways to the zone through that and get detection all the way through that zone. If I'm at a nuclear or an NRC site or, or a DOE site, I may be stacking these three and four high because I have different rules. But I come knowing that. And I also look at environment. You mentioned that yeah. earlier. Plays a massive role, nuisance alarm rejection. Um, it's one thing. And, and, and there's not a sensor on the market, there's not a camera on the market that doesn't see, right? There's not a fence sensor or a microwave on the market that won't detect somebody walking through. But there's a massive difference when it comes to nuisance alarm rejection. Yes. And if you can't take your environmental stuff into that, and these all become vulnerabilities. Why a vulnerability? Because if in your SOC, your guard force, your security forces are ignoring the alarms because you have 1,500 of them a day, well, then that system becomes useless to you and your vulnerability is now expounded. Um, and I know we got way off from your question, but we started talking again, that's just what we do. Um, but my point is, you need to educate yourself 
And then you need to, to, to seek the experts, be able to pick out the sales guy versus the, the consultant style that's gonna help you. Um, and then double check what they're saying because you need industry knowledge. And, and we, the goal is to, to plug your vulnerabilities, right? That's yeah. our end goal. I appreciate that. And one, one other comment would be is, um, can you just speak to what your thoughts are for the involvement of the customer or the end user? What's their involvement? I, I know sometimes I've come across where they just think, hey, they're gonna come in and do the assessment and, and that's it. Um, can you speak to a little bit about what really an end user or customer should realize what's happening with the uh, assessment and, and what their involvement's gonna be in with it? So we have a, a saying, you better inspect what you expect. And as the, as the end user, if, you're, if you've taken your hands off the wheel and you've just allowed the consultant to do, um, as I said when I started out, you set the bar of expectation really low or you set it really high. If you're not engaged, and I'm, I'm saying this from, the consultants will ask. They'll ask questions. They may have, they may have, we talk about checking the boxes. They may have a list to start with just to check the boxes to figure out which direction needs to go. But in the very beginning, you may, as an end user, that end user may not have any idea of what they're really looking at. But that's why they're asking for help. And so I, I do think it's important to, to have engagement, to have that, to, to really inspect what you expect. If you're hoping at the end of the day to have a, a document that gives you this, 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 and this, but you may only end up with this and this, you know, because you weren't involved, or I'm not saying you, but the end user, it's kind of one of those. I, I would take it a step further and just make a bold statement. I think if the end user, the customer, is not involved in the risk assessment, then the risk assessment is essentially useless. And the reason is, um, I can ask all the questions in the world, but I only can ask questions from what I see right. and what's available to me. And I cannot, um, I don't understand the vulnerabilities at a specific site because they're site specific. I don't know the um, details that are outside of my scope. I don't know the history. I don't have the inside information as far as the criticality of certain things. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. If nuclear materials get out, that's a bad thing, right? But I don't have building plans and infrastructure and all of those things to be able to evaluate every risk there, right? And if the end user's not involved, then... Yeah. And, and now, I, I do think that there should be, uh, especially high security sites, some regulatory authority that would be involved as well. But the, the actual site owner has to be involved. We, on the manufacturing side, have over the past couple of years gotten closer to that end customer. And we have a lot of very close relationships with the end customer. It, it's a collaborative effort uh, within our channel, right? So working with the integrator partner, but working at the end user level, because if you're an integrator and you're selling multiple technologies, um, you can't be that subject matter expert in, on yeah. every single product, right? And so we always encourage, bring in your, your manufacturers. Bring us in as, as the resources. It's one big group effort. Um, but we've, we've seen a lot of success, in, in, and we are very, at Bosch, we're very market-specific and very vertical-specific, again, because an application for federal versus education versus utilities, maybe there might be some similarities, but it might be different. But um, again, getting closer to the customer, having them involved, talking about what is what is the plan here, not just today, but what's a roadmap look like, um, and getting them more educated because they have to be involved. If they're not involved, I, I've, I've seen it, I'm sure all of you have seen it, where public bid goes out, low bid, and that customer, they don't even know necessarily what they got. And and that's unfortunate, and I think, you know, again, working closer with them, the consultants, the integrator partners, uh, truly designing specifications around their needs, but then, it's a living, breathing, continuous process of, of supporting that, maintaining it, um, and not just looking, okay, what's going on in the next 12 months, but let's develop a you know, two, right. three, five-year plan. So, um, questions? Yeah, I have a uh, comment and also question on awareness. You're right, uh, holistic security is important. 
because you have proactive sensors and reactive sensors, cameras, stuff like that, 100%. But the threat is evolving much faster sometimes as technology evolves, of course, behind sometimes. For instance, uh, you notice the, the Chinese uh, you know, uh, balloon. They were scanning us, basically. And now you all of a sudden see some Chinese folks out there buying a lot of lands around some key airports, That's Air true. Force Base, right? So what are we doing about that? So you gotta be more, I say, think more critically than the enemy because right now the enemy is ahead of us. We have to be, uh, we have to evolve our thinking if because of our experience. What can they do around that airport? Can they trench it underneath? Can they do holes out there? Look, I know for a fact that we gotta educate ourselves about border security. You, know, you wanna know what's happening in Nicaragua right now? There are a lot of Nigerians flying into Nicaragua. And guess what? They're disappearing, coming to the border. So those are the kind of things that as an industry we need to wake up and really we need to educate because it's impossible for the customer or the end, or the end user to think about those variables because to me, they are like a, like a Roman circus. They're fighting against the, the lions. We are the experts out there. We can bring technology. Plus also we need to know the threat. The technologies, I would say, 99% available, but uh, we need to know each environment. I've, I've done work out there in nuclear facilities, many high level securities out there, but uh, even border security. But right now, it's, it, the threat is constant. We're already invaded in here. What's your take on that? Well, I, I think that, uh, first of all, I agree with you whole, wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I, I can't name them specifically, but there have been three or four uh, national news stories recently in the past year about uh, foreign, foreign agents, foreign nationals buying up property around military installations, around critical infrastructure. Those, those, it's, it's a revolving door and I think we have to understand that. And, and I think we talked a little bit about that, but, but this puts it to point that these risk assessments are, and uh, it's a fluid document. It is alive and it's breathing and it changes. And if you have a facility that um, has a certain level of asset and all of a sudden we have foreign countries buying up all the land surrounding that, that should be the biggest red flag that you see. Now, not maybe you can't do something about that from a, a, a legal standpoint. They have a legal right to own it or whatever. I, I can't get into all of that. But your mindset should change. Your vulnerabilities have definitely changed. You need to evaluate those. Um, and it's not just that type of thing. We, we have different, uh, unfortunately the bad actors out there are growing, they're learning, they're more educated, all of those things, right? right. You look at the, the Metcalf incident, um, it's been 10 plus years now, um, in the critical infrastructure world. Yeah. But prior to that, it changed all the rules. Why? Because you had people long range, being able to shoot rifles, with the intelligence to know exactly what equipment to take out, and equipment that would take out the electric grid for large areas for a part that had an eight month lead time. That was a major change to the industry as a whole. And it's not just uh, a, a human interaction, it could be environmental as well. Yeah. Uh, Nashville, several years ago, flooded very heavily and a huge percentage of the Nashville area was underwater and infrastructure took a massive hit. Part of that was they realized that the breaker boxes, the, the throw switches, everything electrical for their pump stations was below grade. And so when everything flooded, their two main pumps that moved water actually collapsed. And so those are one-off castings for those pumps that cost a half a million dollars a piece. And it takes six to eight months to be able to get those pumps. So whenever you start thinking about, not just from a security aspect, but what does, um, what would your infrastructure, when that happens, how many people know who owns the property around their facilities? How many people know what's, who's, what's changed hands? Uh, you know, when I go to, a, I'll say, a, a, a marine facility, a, a coastal facility to do an assessment, 
and I ask about the three or four boats that are tied up right beside of their facility. Do you know who owns those? I mean, they're sailboats, but and they're moored, but who's, whose are they? What are they? When's the last time they moved? Yeah. What, are they, what are they doing? And, and so it's not just the fact that you protect your property. It's, it is about awareness. Yeah. It's about the fact that when you're walking through a parking lot, we're not acting like a zombie. We're actually watching our surroundings to figure out if I'm fixing to walk into a car or a car is fixing to hit me or you know, just in general, what's happening around you. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, it, it does kind of everything we get, even go back to the holistic approach, everything impacts everything now. We're not an isolated standalone island, uh, even in our own world. I can live off grid, but at some point, you're not really off grid. T technology, you know, we've, we've said this, technology has changed. And as technology grows, expands, migrates, um, the people who use the technology grow, expand, oh, migrate, yeah. or shrink back in some, in some areas. 30 years ago, this was easier, right? A lot the easier. cyber threats weren't there. Everything was analog. You could have redundant lines. We didn't use the term cyber. Right. It was, it, it, Everything was an ice cube relay. Exactly. Um, or AC communicator run up, AC bridge. And it had the butt set. And we have exponentially <laughs> opened the door to more vulnerabilities, which yeah, is right. why we, we've said this multiple times, but this, your risk assessment has to be living and breathing. It has to change based on all of these factors. Agreed. Anthony, Jeff, really appreciate the time. Fantastic conversation. And for everyone in the audience, I hope you found this informative. Thank you, everybody, for the time. Thank you all. Intrepid, smarter perimeter detection systems. To learn more, visit www.southwestmicrowave.com.